President Trump returned early this morning from a surprise trip to Afghanistan, where he said that talks between the U.S. and the Taliban had restarted. At stake, the prospects for peace in this conflict-wracked nation. But also at stake, progress for women there who, when ruled by the Taliban, could not work, study, or even leave the house without a male escort. Special correspondent Jane Ferguson reports. In one of the toughest countries in the world to be a woman, this clinic offers a refuge. The Afghan women visiting Dr. Najmusa Mashefajo this morning will get some of the best care in the country. This is an x-ray of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. She is one of Afghanistan's top gynecologists, an expert on women's reproductive health. Good morning. Dr. Shifajo gave us a tour of her clinic full of the latest technology that she imported herself. For the patients that you see, how important is this sort of equipment? For the patient, it is, uh, we, we reach to the, to the diagnosis soon and there is no need to go outside the country. So it saves lives? Yeah, of course. This is the nose. This is the mouth. To Dr. Shifajo, interaction with her patients is important. Here the mother sees the, the baby, the, her own ultrasound. How do they react? <laughs> yeah, they are very happy. Right now they know this is the head, this is the heart, this is, this is the, the stomach, because I teach them. That's one reason women love coming here. Mm -hmm. It would have been absolutely unthinkable for Afghan women just 20, even 10 years ago to have had this kind of technology. Dr. Shifajo knows that mm. all too well. She began her career delivering babies on mud floors in Taliban-controlled parts of the country. When you were working underneath Taliban rule, did you ever imagine that one day you'd have a clinic like this, equipment like this? <laughs> I, was a, I had a hope. You pictured it? Yeah, yeah. Since the U.S. invasion, Afghan women like Dr. Shifajo have through their own hard work and self-belief, built incredible new lives. That's why, today, they watch the news anxiously. A major campaign promise by President Trump was to bring American troops home. And in September, he came close to making a deal with the Taliban after more than nine months of negotiations in Qatar. Negotiations where Afghan women, quite literally, had no seat at the table. The Taliban ruled Afghanistan from 1996 until their ouster by U.S.-led forces in 2001. That was a deeply cruel time for Afghan women. The Taliban's harsh interpretation of Islamic law afforded them virtually no rights. Trump's deal has fallen apart for now, but women like Fareshta Karim are afraid their rights could still be pushed aside to make it happen. She's part of a new generation, educated Afghan women completely invested in this country's future. She discovered Afghan children had trouble getting hold of books to read, so she gathered donations and bought a few old buses, turning them into mobile libraries. We joined Fareshta in one poor neighborhood of Kabul on her way to a school. It allows them to have general knowledge and broaden their horizons of life and understanding of world and inspire them, inspire them to think about what they want to be and also understand different characters' role, put themselves in different characters' shoes, and start, start having an understanding of complex human feelings. And I think this all adds to one's critical thinking. Freshta won a scholarship to study for a master's degree in public policy at Oxford University in England. After returning to Afghanistan, she took a job as an analyst with the government but her heart was elsewhere. And whenever I would work with children, that would make me happy because Afghanistan is one of the youngest countries in the world. And it made so much sense to me to work with, with people who will be the future of this country. How do you keep hopeful and keep motivated and keep inspired to keep doing this work? I think children, we have the responsibility to create that opportunity for them to meet their potentials. Her potential is at stake, however, if the Taliban returns to power. So I think many of us, or at least I can talk about myself, I might push back for as long as I can to resist and to, 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 to fight for the city that we have built it ourselves. Outside major cities, much of life looks similar to the way it did under Taliban rule. Child marriage is rampant, as is violence against women. It's in the home that women are most at risk. Those that escape abusive husbands are the lucky ones. 
The day I left home, my husband had beaten me very badly and I had injuries on my head, so I left with my children and ran to the police station. This young woman, whom we won't name for her own safety, is one of them. The police brought her to this shelter. Her husband, she tells us, is a violent drug addict. When he was beating me, I was thinking about how I could run away. But how would I raise the children and keep them in school? Amid a climate of fear and intimidation, even the shelters can be vulnerable places. This one is managed by a U.S.-based charity. And those who run it tell us people in the community still opposed to women's rights spread lies about the shelters. And the facilities come under attack. Even the location is kept secret, and we are not allowed to film anything that could betray where it is. But for thousands of battered women who have come through here, it's a lifeline. Women like this 22-year-old who escaped her abusive husband six months ago. My husband was a drug smuggler, and he always used to keep knives and guns. Every night, I thought he might kill me. If these shelters had not been here, if this facility did not exist, where would you have gone? If there had not been a shelter like this, I might have killed myself because there's no place for a woman to go if there are not these shelters. Elsewhere in Kabul, we see what she means. The burns unit at Istiklal Government Hospital is a depressing place, not just because of the power cuts and poor hygiene. Dr. Abdul Khalid Wakila has seen an increase in self-immolation. Women pouring gasoline over themselves and lighting a match. It is only the patients with burns who come to us. Those who eat poison or do something else to themselves go to another part of the hospital. So I can only say that the easiest thing for them to use is gasoline. They have access to it. Sat on the end of her bed and completely alone, this young woman has burns across much of her body and a deep gash over her throat. She responds to questions with just a whisper. At first, she told the doctor it was an accident, but later confided it wasn't. There are laws to protect women in Afghanistan, but where the letter of that law becomes enforcement is the bigger challenge. There is a huge distance between laws and implementation. Shahrzad Akbar is the new head of Afghanistan's Human Rights Commission. It requires not only changing the legal framework, which there have been improvements in the legal framework, but also it, changing the mentality and behavior of people who deliver justice across Afghanistan, you know. Akbar won a scholarship to study abroad and completed a master's degree at Smith College in Massachusetts. She wanted to apply that education to making life better for women in Afghanistan. For many women I know, they aspire to lives different and better than their mothers. For some, it's as simple as saying, you know what, I want to have access to a clinic when I give birth. That's it. I'm not interested in education. I'm not interested in becoming a pilot. I want to marry. I want to have children. But I know that it's my right to have access to health care when I give birth. At just 31 years old, she feels huge pressure to lead the way for other Afghan women. It changes a lot for the young, younger girls who are watching us. I'm, every day I'm conscious of being watched. They also watch to see what choices powerful politicians are making. If the Taliban were to return to power, she says, Afghanistan's women risk losing everything. Women were stoned by them, uh, women were flagged by them, and, and this is continuously happening in areas under their control. Now imagine the possibility of them not only coming back to power, but also determining what the laws of Afghanistan will look like. Uh, that's really scary. Flying up to Badakhshan province in the rural north of Afghanistan, we met with a group of 83 Taliban fighters who had surrendered to government forces just a few days before. We challenged them on their attitudes. If the Taliban come back into power, how will things be different for women this time around? There should be some changes, like in university with co-education. There should not be things like that, like you, standing here and not covering yourself, wearing this kind of tight clothing. It's not allowed. Would you work with female leaders in government? We are not against women's education because we do need doctors, we need educated females, but it should be in a framework of Islamic principles. But back in Kabul, Dr. Shafajo tells us she sees Islamic principles already being applied by women in their lives every day. 
with the services they provide through their professions. We want our right as a woman, as a doctor, as a mother, and as an Afghan, as a Muslim. You have daughters. What do you hope for their future? How do you picture it? <laughs> for my elder daughter, I want her to be a pilot. <laughs> She's also, also interested to travel a lot, but for the others, they are interested to be a doctor. Like their mom. <laughs> As politicians negotiate with the Taliban to end the war, Afghan women risk losing their hard-fought freedoms and rights. They could end up paying a devastating price for peace in Afghanistan. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jane Ferguson in Kabul, Afghanistan.